Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Virgo speaking, and uh, uh, I would like to welcome you all um, in today's session or meeting regarding the um, Life uh, Inaugural Conference. Uh, in reference to the conference per se, I would like you to have your micros unmute and also uh, before I open the, 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 the today's session, um, I would like to, to, in regards to the mode, to say that uh, questions per speaker will be addressed at the end um, during the session we have uh, at the discussion uh, session. Um, today's inaugural conference entitled Organic Mineral Fertilizers Using Recovered Sulfur Residues and Orange Processing Byproducts to Restore Soil Fertility and Sustainability from Desertification uh, refers to the Life EU Research Project, which signifies one of the many more ongoing actions to confront environmental deterioration due to irreversible gradual climate change. This research project challenges the efficiency of processed organic and inorganic industrial byproducts and wastes for upgrading soil fertility within the context of global food security and civilization. In our case, the vehicle of this research project is a processed combined fertilizer with beneficiaries, the soil physicochemical properties and production sustainability parameters to sufficiently produce quality durum wheat from deserted arable land. The consortium for the research project we're talking about um, <clears throat> consists of SBS Steel, Branca SPA, Azienda Agricola Calabro, Azienda Agricola Liani, Universita Mediterranea di Reggio Calabria, and the Perotis College with the educational farm of the American Farm School. With that said, I turn the floor to Mr. Massimo Rinaldi, Materials Engineer and Business Developer Manager, Warren Group Italy, for his remarks. Rinaldi. Okay. Mr. Rinaldi, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, good, good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you, Evangelos, for your introduction. Now I will start a presentation, a short presentation of LIFE program, just to make uh, all the participants aware of uh, what is the LIFE program. Uh, that is a founding program that has allowed this project to, to start and also giving uh, some indication on the new opportunities because the program is still open and it is still possible to submit proposal. I share my presentation. Um, okay. Um, just a second. Okay. And uh, uh, just a quick introduction of uh, who I am and who is the company I work with. Uh, Warrant Hub is a company located in Italy uh, that uh, provides the consulting services to support organization in general in participating and managing uh, research uh, and innovation European projects. Uh, throughout uh, uh, European programs in general. Um, we give uh, all uh, um, kind of uh, support to European project uh, writing and preparation, but also has a, we are a, sometimes a partner of proposal, having active roles in, pro in project management and dissemination, communication, directly funded by European Commission, but we can also uh, give general uh, administrative and consulting uh, support to all organizations involved or in such programs. Um, we can act in several ways as a coordinator, partner, and consultant, and take into account that uh, we can play also different uh, roles, but we are in different countries. 
our headquarter is located in Italy, but we have a sister company located in Belgium, France, and Bulgaria. And in the last few months, we acquired also a company located in Spain. And now let's go straight to the LIFE program. The LIFE program is the European founding instrument for the environment and the climate uh, change in general. It has been created uh, 30 years ago and he, it has co-financed thousands of projects. And it is one of the most important programs supporting green ideas for the environment in general. We have to take into account when we think about the LIFE program, we are not thinking about research theoretical projects, but we are thinking, we have to think about a solution really close to the market. We have to think about demonstration activities in a real environment. In a LIFE project, the research result should be applied in a real environment. And this slide is a general overview of the LIFE program, giving the, the numbers that are really, really relevant, and also taking into account that now, till 2027, we have more than 5 billion euros available to support uh, um, projects in four main domains. Uh, the LIFE program, target is uh, nature and biodiversity, circular economy in general, let's think about waste uh, and circular economy, climate change, mitigation and adaptation, but also clean energy transition. Anyway, um, the, the approach is a pretty bottom up of this program, but we have to be aware that the European Commission want to support innovative solutions in general. When we think about innovative solutions, we, uh, we can have different kinds of projects. Uh, the first uh, one is uh, uh, a pilot project can be supported by the LIFE program. And when we think about a pilot project, we should think about something new compared to the state of the heart. And so the level of innovation is very high. But we also can think about a demonstration project. In that case, we have to think about uh, something new for a sector. And so it's more or less a technology transfer idea. And in that case, the level of innovation is a bit uh, lower. Or another option is to think about best practice project. And so not the implementation of new technologies, but uh, methodologies to be applied. Take also into account uh, the general rules of this program that are really pe peculiar because it's uh, one of the few European programs where the partnership is not mandatory and where the transnationality is not required. And so a single company from a single, comp from a single country can apply. Anyway, the uh, partnership and the transnationality brings uh, uh, additional uh, premium points. And so is uh, something uh, that brings added value. The co-financing by European Commission is uh, relevant. We we'll think that um, the 60% of uh, direct costs are granted. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, that there is something relevant. And take also into account that the foundings are given in advance before starting the, the project itself. Uh, the average project size is uh, between 1 million and 5 million. And so you should think about uh, not small project, but a medium one. What are the partners? Any public or private entity can join the uh, program. The consortium is not necessary, but what is necessary is that the project is developed within the EU. And so only EU countries and uh, EU organizations from EU countries can apply. Non-EU activities uh, can sometimes be financed, but is something a bit uh, risky. And so it's not suggested. suggested. 
Another point important is to know what are the costs that can be founded. Limited costs of uh, research activities um, that are more uh, considered preparatory activities, industrial development costs, cost of monitoring, costs also related to business planning, brand creation, uh, communication costs, but also all administrative uh, management costs and also the consultancy activities offered by uh, uh, companies specialized in European projects. And uh, this is important because uh, if you want to apply a life project, you can be supported by a, by a company, by a private company, and the cost of the company, the cost of management of the company can be directly founded by European Commission. Um, the life program is a bottom-up program, and so um, you have general indication of topics, but you are uh, really open to, to propose activities to the European Commission with the a limitation that all the activities founded must bring uh, environmental advantages or, uh, for example, CO2 reduction, uh, waste reduction, and so on. But there are some specific topics that the European Commission consider um, uh, pivotal in this moment, and some of them are related to the agricultural sector. And so take particular attention to these topics because uh, projects in this domain are particularly welcome. Um, I mean, the, 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 the theme, the thematic area of uh, protecting the quality of European soil, preventing soil degradation, the use of sustainable practices uh, related to land management, and also the remediation of soil pollution. Uh, all that is related to the improve of water quality, for example, through reduce uh, nitrate uh, leakage or uh, throughout the reduction of uh, carbon storage in general, the emission of carbon storage. Uh, all uh, the um, climate uh, change adaptation, uh, adaptation solution for farmers, for example. Another thematic area is the forest management. Uh, and uh, also the, the link to nature uh, 2000s manager and other land managers. Another uh, um, priority area of this moment is the one related to the promotion of carbon farming methodology. Another point is the, the use of practices that decrease uh, the non CO2 emission from agricultural activities. For example, think about precision farming or uh, sustainable livestock or uh, manual management. And so these topics are uh, relevant topics for the sustainable agriculture in general. And if you have any ideas on these topics, uh, be careful because uh, your ideas uh, can be founded by European Commission. Uh, let's have a look to the deadlines. Uh, the new call for proposal 2022 will close the 4th of October. This means that if you want to apply this year, you should start now to think about a new project and to start writing it. The evaluation result will arrive more or less end of April 2023, and your project will start uh, next summer. And so these are the deadlines if you want to apply this year. But take into account that the LIFE program will have new deadlines each year. And so if you are not ready for this call deadline, you should think about a, a new project next year in 2023. If you have an idea, feel free to, to contact us, to, to ask us some uh, indication. Uh, but anyway, take into account that the pillars are an innovative solution for the sector, an innovative solution for Europe, and so not for outside Europe. And another point uh, is that you should think about a, few, a future ambitious project that will start next year, but you should apply now for a future idea. 
uh, that's all from my side and uh, i hope that uh, you have some uh, i give you some useful indication to think about future projects that can be founded by life program thank you mr rinaldi you kept the time exactly very sharply and uh, um, uh, you gave us very very good uh, and valuable uh, information regarding um, um, the life program what it represents and what I kept is circular economy and innovation are the most important uh, aspects that uh, life is dealing with uh, with that said, I would like to move on to uh, the next presentation by Dr. Adele Muscolo, Professor of Soil Chemistry and Ecology, Mediterranean University of Reggio Calabria in Italy, for her remarks. You have the floor, Professor. Thank you. Professor, mute your uh, your micro, please. Okay. Yeah. You can see the slide. Yes. Okay. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I am Professor Muscol from Mediterranean University of Reggio Calabria, and I am uh, really uh, happy to share with you my the result of this uh, research. Uh, that are also preliminary results that are uh, useful for the LIFE uh, project. Uh, we used uh, agriculture uh, waste and sulfur uh, botanied from the residues of the desulfurization of a natural gas and oil to prepare fertilizers for agricultural purposes. Why uh, this research, research is so important at the moment? Because we are assisting to an increasing in world population and uh, this uh, is leading to a major request of food. In particular way of vegetable food because we are also shifting um, to a uh, healthy uh, uh, food uh, consumer that uh, is more vegan and vegetarian. So we need to produce more uh, crop, more food, and this can have an impact on soil because we are assisting into an intense tillage and also an uh, excessive fertilization. In particular way, uh, the farmers are using more uh, mineral fertilizer. These practices can alter often in a reversible way the uh, soil ecosystem functioning, the soil ecological equilibrium impacting mainly on soil biodiversity, on soil microbial biomass, on um, nutrient cycle and on nutrient availability that is important for the plant growth. And also we can have also an impact on soil chemical and biological growth. So there is, uh, sorry. So we have an urgent need to increase the crop uh, production respecting the sustainability of a cropping chain. This means that we have to reduce the input of agrochemical and mineral fertilizer in particular way to be in line with the European uh, Union, the European Commission and the new policy that is the Green Deal, in particular the Farm to Fork strategy that is part of the Green Deal and the European Biodiversity Strategy for 2030. Uh, uh, the, uh, the objective are the abatement of pesticide, chemical fertilizer, antibiotic, together with a large increase in organic farming, because the Green Deal uh, wants to, uh, um, to preserve the well-being and the health of a citizen, uh, contrasting uh, the climatic uh, change that, uh, and uh, to reach the uh, neutral climatic uh, uh, strategy uh, by 2050. What we can do 
at the moment. Uh, we can encourage the industrial uh, world and the farmer world to develop innovative solutions for a greener future. And this is based on a circular bioeconomy principle, uh, uh, whose aim is to find options that can reduce waste by reusing, reducing and recycling. This study uh, that started uh, in 2015 so with a cooperation uh, uh, with the Steel Belt System um, uh, wants to uh, reuse, recycle and uh, um, reduce waste, in particular uh, industrial and agricultural waste, uh, and transform this in resource. Uh, we support the Steel Belt System in identifying the best size shape of Pads uh, for agriculture purpose uh, that uh, these pads were um, uh, composed by agricultural elemental sulfur, agricultural waste elemental sulfur, and identified the optimal percentage of each single component in the pads and the amount of the pads that uh, uh, need to be used for hectare to improve and in the best way the soil properties and crop performance. The elemental sulfur is, uh, that is uh, obtained from residues of the sulfurization of natural gas and oil is considered a pollutant for the environment and can have a serious impact on human health. Generally, it is used to produce sulfuric acid, but it's not a sustainable uh, process. So we want to, to find another way to eliminate this waste. Orange residues is a byproduct obtained from food processing industries. And it's uh, rich of valuable compounds, but it's considered um, uh, not suitable for the environment if it is left in, on soil in a, uh, in a small area because it uh, contains recalcitrant uh, substances and can uh, affect uh, the soil uh, quality. Sulfur generally is insoluble in water and to be used for agricultural purpose needs to be mixed with the bentonite, that is an inert clay, to form a pellet. When the clay becomes wet in soil, it swells and breaks the pellet into many small pieces with a very large reactive surface area that releases sulfur. The sulfur released in soil requires a microbial biomass in soil because it needs to be oxidated to sulfate before the plants can take it up. The rate of oxidation uh, and the, the, the time of oxidation is largely governed by the property of the soils that have a, a, a big impact on this and from environmental conditions. What is the novelty of this study? Uh, from a, an environmental point of view is the use of two different waste in a unique process. So we reuse, recycle and reduce two different kinds of waste. Uh, using a unique process, industrial process with a du dual aim to improve uh, the quality and fertility of the soil in a sustainable way, but at the same time, our aim is to, to increase also uh, crop productivity, but mainly the crop quality, because now the attention of a consumer, consumer is to the quality of a crop. This is a brief introduction uh, to sulfur processes. The sulfur is recovered by gas, oil, recall, and then the gas is used to produce a fertilizer. The pastilles uh, were developed from a mixture of sodium or bentonite clay with elemental sulfur, and uh, this, this more suitable shape and size for the pastille have been chosen on, on the preliminary data that we uh, uh, have obtained in the lab. This is the, uh, what happens uh, on the right. There is the, the last, uh, the final uh, fertilizer produced. This fertilizer has been tested in pots to avoid external perturbation in environment in a um, protected environment, and uh, we use the alkaline. Uh, sandylum soil, uh, because generally the sulfur is used also to uh, decrease the pH of soil. Uh, the sulfur used, uh, the, the, the sulfur bentonite on orange residues uh, uh, fertilizer used, uh, were used at 
at two different concentrations and were compared to NPK, uh, host manure or as organic fertilizer, an internal uh, uh, control was uh, and not amended the soil. Uh, we cultivated the two different species on, uh, on, uh, with this kind of fertilizer and uh, an onion, uh, red onion uh, that is cultivated in Calabria, that is a sulfur lover, and a lettuce that is another kind of crop. Uh, we, um, after maturation of these uh, two uh, crops, uh, we analyzed the, the soils. The maturation is more or less after three months of cultivation. Uh, here reported the result related to soil chemical biochemical parameters that we had uh, after uh, the collection of lettuce. We can see uh, that we have a, a decrease in pH uh, in respect to the other treatment when we use the sulfur bentonite at both concentration. And we observed an increase uh, in uh, uh, the oxidative uh, activity of soils that is uh, um, uh, displayed by the increase in the hydrogenase activity that is a marker of oxidative reductase in soil. Uh, we obtained also an increase uh, in uh, organic carbon only in respect to control and EPK, but not in respect to the organic fertilizer, of course, and also an increase in CN ratio that is uh, in respect to uh, the uh, control and EPK uh, that um, a, 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 a CN ratio less than 10. Uh, this means that we have a, a mineralization process activated in soil. Regarding the nutrient that we expressed as cation and anion, we observed an increase in sulfate of course in respect to the other um, the other treatment, but also an increase in important nutrients that are ammonium, magnesium, and calcium that are important for the uh, nutritive properties of the plants. Regarding soil chemical and biochemical parameters after onion growth, we observed some difference. We don't observe the decrease in soil pH, but we observed an increase in soil phenols that are potent antioxidant precursor of organic uh, humic substances, an increase in uh, organic carbon, an increase in, in CN rat. We have a more um, um, humification process in respect to the mineralization process, FDI uh, and uh, oxidative reductive activity of the soil increased, and organic matter, of course. Uh, we observed the same uh, for the uh, anion and cation, an increase in sulfate, an increase in ammonium, magnesium, and calcium. Regarding a pot experiment with uh, lettuce and uh, onion uh, that we grew in uh, pots, amended with diff different fertilizer, we collected the plant and we examined the, the growth parameter. In this slide, there is uh, the growth parameters related to lettuce. Uh, we observed that we have uh, no significant difference among uh, uh, plant A and the circumference leaf number, but we have a significant difference in uh, respect to uh, fresh uh, weight that increased in presence only uh, of an EPK organic matter. Regarding the nutritive properties of lettuce, we observed that, that, that the, the property increased with sulfur bentonite fertilizer, in particular increased the flavonoid, the, the total antioxidant capacity, vitamin A, E, and also vitamin C in presence of the higher concentration of uh, as uh, sulfur bentonite. We observed also an increase in the antioxidant capacity of the plants that is really important because the, uh, it's the ability of a uh, plant to uh, eliminate uh, free radicals. Uh, we observed that it increased the, the total antioxidant ability and the PPH that is a scavenger of hydroxyl uh, uh, pero peroxyl uh, um, radical in uh, plants. We observed uh, also uh, important uh, results when uh, with the onion. 
Uh, at, uh, in, in respect to lecture, uh, the growth parameter of onion increased all in presence of sulfur bentonite. We observed a big increase also in bulb diameter in leaf length, plant height, fresh weight of plants. Uh, but we have to consider that uh, sul uh, the onion is a sulfur lover. Uh, regarding the nutritive properties of the onion, we observed an increase in total phenols in respect to lectures that were increased the flavonoids. Uh, we have an increase in total antioxidant ability and also in um, vitamin uh, C, E, in particular way, uh, in respect uh, to uh, lectures. We have also an increase in antioxidant capacity. So all uh, both crop species uh, were able to uh, increase the uh, scavenger ability of the plants. In short, what uh, our result uh, explain and say uh, that uh, we can uh, conclude that the sulfur bentonite plus orange waste represent a corrective nutritional fertilizer whose unique formulation in pads allows an easy distribution and a quick disintegration with a rapid improvement of chemical and biological soil properties as well as an increase in crop quality. We have to consider that we uh, have the result after three months of cultivation. So the soil properties changed in a short time. The results evidence the specificity between the crop species and the mineral organic fertilizer that we used. Of course, we have a better result in, in crop uh, species that is onion, that is a sulfur lover, but increased also a lot to the nutraceutical property of lettuce that generally is not considered a vegetal with a good nutritive properties. The mineral organic fertilizer increased, in this case, biocompounds with beneficial effect on human health, enhancing the medical economic values of crops with positive impact on bio and green economy. And at the end, we can say also that the use of this fertilizer is uh, um, important because can contribute to reduce CO2 and CH4 emission that are due to the decrease in the production and the use of a chemical fertilizer and can also decrease the cost for landfilling of uh, the, the waste, can recover soil that are under pressure allowing to consider the manufacturing process a clean and sustainable process. Thank you for your attention. Well, Professor Muscolo, you had to accomplish a very heavy load of work. Congratulations. Um, your specialized research, I suppose, technically ties in well with the majority of the UN goals in regards to food security and poverty. And it provides expectations for a better world, I think, via waste management. So keep up the good work. Um, <laughs> I go to the next um, um, uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Antonio Scaletti, who is the project leader of this live program and strategy director of SBS Steel Belt Systems in Italy. Uh, Mr. Scaletti. You have the floor, thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am uh, speaking uh, to you from uh, SBS company. And uh, here around me, the, there are all the other part of the team. Uh, we are working together uh, in SBS, uh, starting from the president of SBS, uh, Mr. Calamara, uh, Mr. Contesi, Ms. Cristina Calamara and Mr. Renato Calamara. We are uh, here all together because we would like uh, to share uh, some information regarding uh, the project, the LIFE project. And uh, SBS is the coordinating entity. So it's not easy to come after the top scientific presentation of Professor Muscolo. So I will try to do my best. And first of all, I share the presentation here. 
And uh, I hope you can see. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yes, but you have to put it in full screen, please. Yeah, full screen. yeah. Hey, full screen. Uh, I am already in full screen. Huh? I am already in full screen. I... Now you are. Okay, okay. Yes. Impostazioni di visualizzazione. Suggestion. Yes. Let's try. What happened? I get this one? Yeah, this is it. Thank okay. you. Okay, now we... Okay. Okay, so very, very shortly, uh, we are very proud uh, in uh, SBS to align uh, the business and also the organic mineral fertilizers uh, business uh, to at least five different uh, sustainable development goals by the United Nations. As Mr. Vergos said before, we are trying really to support the improvement of our planet, and these are the, the top goals. Of course, we focus so much in the organic mineral fertilizer business on the areas under desertification in the world we can see that there are six areas, six big areas under desertifications. And we are in Italy, in Greece, we are within one of those areas, which is the Mediterranean Basin. And we need to do something for for this desertification. And we believe that the fertilizers we are developing is the right way to prevent the desertification, actually to revert the desertification through the organic mineral fertilizers, which are decreasing the pH of the soil. So we are absolutely within the green economy, and that's why we are fully aligned to the goals of the LIFE project introduced before by Mr. Rinaldi. This is the company. This is where I'm speaking uh, right now to you, all of you. And uh, this is uh, the, the quarter of the company in uh, Varese. And uh, SBS is uh, an EPC company, which means that we develop and manufacture machinery for uh, the fertilizers. And uh, we have the know-how inside the company. And we have uh, two plants, one in uh, the north of Italy, in Varese, and another one instead uh, in Sicily. There are five different uh, business uh, area we are working uh, within uh, the SBS company. And the fertilizers business uh, is the last one, is the latest one. Okay, last but surely not least. And uh, we have already developed uh, many production lines for uh, different uh, fertilizers. And now we are working uh, on the organic mineral fertilizers through the LIFE project. As you can see, we are working with important names uh, such as uh, Saipem, Techint, uh, Eni, but also uh, important companies uh, 
in the oil and gas, which is the original business of SBS, such as Saudi Aramco and the Luke Oil. As Professor Muscolo said before, we are in partnership with the University of Reggio Calabria, the Mediterranean University of Reggio Calabria, uh, for a long time, and we have been developing together the organic mineral fertilizers of the LIFE project. So we are absolutely into a circular economy, which is part of the green economy, because we are taking as raw materials, we are taking the sulfur from the uh, refinery of the oil, and at the same time, we are also recovering the uh, orange waste, which means we dry the orange peels and we have a powder that we can use for the organic fertilizers. These are some uh, visual uh, evidence uh, of what we did uh, together with the university. Preliminary results, as the professor said before, and as you can see, studying uh, together with the university and uh, using uh, their also scientific approach, we arrived to have a B, combination B, which is the best one, uh, compared to all the others, and can deliver a 30% productivity increase. Okay, so sulfur, bentonite, and uh, organic component, uh, orange powder from the peel of oranges is the, uh, is the special mix for the organic mineral fertilizer we are studying uh, in, the life, uh, in the LIFE project. The LIFE project we are speaking about today is uh, a 4 million uh, euro project, and uh, we got uh, financing for 55% of the 4 million total project. And this project has been started in September 1st, 2021. And we are absolutely on track in delivering all the required milestones and deliverables. There are two goals. There are two overall goals for the LIFE project. The first one is to build an industrial pilot production line up to 20,000 tons in Sicily. We are working on that, we are on time, and we will have the plant ready by this summer. And we have chosen Sicily not only because there is, there is the second plant of SBS, but also because in Sicily it's very easy to find the raw materials such as sulfur and also the orange powder from the peels of oranges. The second goal of the LIFE project is the extensive field tests that we are going to implement, uh, starting from uh, September, on 27 hectares in Greece, in uh, Italy, in uh, Calabria, in the south, and also in Abruzzo, in uh, central Italy. And uh, in this way, we will move uh, out from the pots into the fields, and uh, we will uh, test uh, the organic mineral fertilizers on the durum wheat and vegetables. So it will be very interesting, very challenging, and 
uh, we will share with, with all of you the results along the way, along the way of this uh, 42 months project. All the project, every step, everything that we are doing, you can find on the project website, which is reported, reported here. We are implementing this life project because before we did a basic research and we got, we got two different patents. One on the product, the organic mineral fertilizer itself, and one on the process, the process made on our machinery. And it is an ongoing, continuous process, not by batches. And we have a patent also on that with the machinery that we develop. Here you can see some of the machineries in, uh, in a pilot way, because this is the test center. And we are fine tuning as well as also studying, continuously studying the fertilizers here in our test center that we have in, in Varese. The test center is owned by SBS with specialized machinery for, uh, for testing. And here you can see instead the 3D rendering of the production line that we are going to implement in Sicily. These are the engineering 3D renderings and the production line will have a top production capacity of 20,000 tons per year. We are going to set up by this summer, so we will start the production in winter time. And um, just to close everything and to give you a visual a snapshot of the machinery that we are uh, doing, we are uh, developing from an engineering point of view and also manufacturing. Here you can see some uh, photos and some names, uh, among which you can see Saudi Aramco, one of the top companies in the world. And uh, SBS is a supplier for this kind of machinery to these uh, top companies. So I really thank you, uh, everybody, for the attention. And uh, I can stop here. And uh, my intention was really to give an overview of the uh, life project and uh, of SBS company. I kindly ask you to also follow on our project on the website and uh, we will bring to you all the results along the way thank you thank you everybody thank you mr mr scaletti uh, let me make a comment <clears throat> uh, of how important it is to understand um, what the impact of wastes and byproducts is or are in terms of sustainable development. Um, all of a sudden, uh, something that was thrown away started a new industry somewhere. And that is the impact in the, of, in the community development, I would say. So uh, here we are, uh, we practice it under real conditions and thank you for the opportunity to be part of it. And with this, uh, I move to uh, Dr. Athanasios Gertzis, Professor of Chair in Graduate Studies uh, in Sustainable Agriculture and Management and Director of Krinos Olive Center, Perutis College. Um, um, Dr. Gertzis, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, uh, as I told you, I'm in, in between two conferences. I am in uh, Volos. Volos is a city about two and a half hours from Thessaloniki, and I'm attending a, a very interesting uh, conference, it's International Symposium. And the subjects we're discussing here are quite related with your topics, 
it has to do with the climate change effects, modeling, prediction, and uh, my uh, particular presentation will be uh, dealing with spraying drones and uh, which will be connected to my presentation. So allow me to uh, share my screen. I have to do main, probably the same thing as I did before. First of all, uh, let me see if I can go to the presentation. Can you see my screen in presentation mode? All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. I will try to be short and to the point, and, and I thank Chris, Christos for allowing me switching because I need to run downstairs after my presentation. So, first of all, congratulations for this project. It's important projects like that to contribute to uh, the new philosophy that, in my opinion, that was established after 2019 from the European Union. In my generation, and I'm the same age with uh, Dr. Vergos, we got to know each other for more than 42 years, so you can guess our age. We were talking about fertilizers, maximizing yield at any cost, applying chemicals at any cost, the more the better, because they were cheap. Applying water, the more the better, because it was available. That happened 40 years ago. Those sort of mistakes, plus the climate change, which actually led to the climate change, um, led us to do a lot of rethinking, not simply reusing, recycling, etc., but rethinking. So I'm going to do a short presentation. Uh, hopefully, I will contribute a little bit on your, uh, the role of biostimulants on, uh, in plant health and nutrition. So now, we are not talking about plant fertilization, we're talking about plant nutrition and health. That is closer to the concepts we use for human health and nutrition. We have to remember that the plants are organisms which preceded the existence or the um, appearance of humans. So Vangelis introduced myself, I don't need to say anymore. We are working with uh, Vangelis for since the start of this college back in uh, 90, uh, 96, but even previous in uh, research. So I will do my presentation um, in a way that I will provide you evidence from existing literature, uh, although I could have done some presentation, including our own results, um, me and uh, my colleague Christos Vasilikiotis, the next presenter, we have worked a lot in the use of biosimilant before this concept and these projects were well known. So we are proud that we are, were pioneers. But I will present you some more recent results to make my point. So, uh, and all this presentation will be available along with the references cited in this presentation for a you can distribute them to anybody. So, um, biostimulants are products reduce the need of fertilizers and also increase plant growth, resistant to water and abiotic stresses. I just highlighted in yellow this part of the abstract which I consider the most important. So if you understand, these are stones we can hit many birds with one stone as the expression is. So these products allow increasing yield and also the quality, which is important. In this case, we hit two birds with one stone, increasing yield and quality, which must be linked. The quality of the product has to do with the health of humans and also a healthy plant cannot produce, uh, or reversely, a non-healthy plant cannot produce high, neither good quality products. So this is a, re, uh, a review, um, a very recent review by 2019. Well, the, uh, this is a picture that shows in a very broad aspect, what is these emerging projects? I don't like the word emerging projects. We knew these products. We knew these products, but now 
we see them and we integrate them in our new production systems because the key issue is sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture can mean a lot of things. And, and uh, one extra aspect of sustainable agriculture is to think about the next chain of agriculture, which is the consumer. Again, plant health is related from now on to human health. So these products include tremendous amount of uh, uh, substances like acids, microbials, extracts. Uh, uh, Antonio mentioned the word bentonite, organic and inorganic. Uh, you cannot imagine the uses of these projects. Just hitting that word bentonite, Antonio, let me give you an example. Three days ago, um, I sprayed a cornfield of a friend of mine who is located very close to my farm. By the way, I'm also a farmer, so allow me to speak from a farmer's point of view as well. That material deters what is the major problem in that area. It's not diseases, it's not productivity. They managed to do all of this. The main problem is wild boars. Those animals which were freed a few years ago, they reproduce like hell. So they find out that spraying by bentonite will deter, and it works. Don't ask me for scientific explanation. It works. That's the point. So you can, there, there is still a long way to go to find out additional uses of all these products. So this is a very good uh, review paper, which uh, includes a data um, uh, uh, a meta-analysis of 120 qualified studies. And there, is, there are plenty of studies. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. So I highlighted from this study, which again is a very recent one. It's published in April 2022, as you can see. Um, the major results were that the uh, add-on, the yield benefit among the various biostimulants used, um, in an average, increased the yield by almost 18% and reached, and this is important, the highest potential through treatments by soil. Remember that these products can be applied in the soil and also foliar and also in fertigation systems. So it's important to remember that their main effect and, uh, is through soil treatment. That implies that the main effect of this must be or the main products should have been microorganisms. Also, you, you are from Sicily, you have an arid climate there. So I think this, the application on arid climates and vegetables had the highest impact on crop yield. So here we have nice tools to do sustainable agriculture, to minimize cost and to increase our benefit. And the third conclusion from that very thorough overview was this biostimulants were more efficient in low soil organic matter content, non-neutral, uh, saline, nutrient insufficient, and sandy soils. Does this ring a bell to you? So all these are marginal soils, and they exist in Greece, in, uh, in, in Italy, in many countries in Europe, in Spain. One-third of Spain's land is already called the certified zone. So let's keep an eye on this. We have excellent tools to achieve the sustainable goals. Uh, that's another editorial, um, another paper. Um, again, very recent. It's in the agronomy paper in 2022. Um, they mentioned that this segment, the biostimulant industry, is becoming increasingly important worldwide. If you ask me when this happened, it slowly happened in uh, about 10 years before, but if you see on my second part of my presentation, legislation changed it completely. So that's the European Union's legislation after 2019. Uh, I will skip some of these uh, slides because it's needless to talk about the, use, the usefulness of these products you can have it and you can read it on your own uh, time. 
That's why I have small letters here. Don't, don't, you don't need to read this one. I will skip this one again. Um, and uh, I will focus now on what happened in EU. Uh, in 2019, a new legislation was introduced and they included a new category in the fertilizers. So these are biostimulants. And uh, this market is increasing. Currently, it's valued to, these numbers, of course, are relative, 2.5 billions, but it's expected to grow, to double almost in uh, very soon, in two, three years. Probably this forecasted figure will be, I expect it to be much higher. I don't know, well, we're talking about billions now. It's, you know, even 4.5 billion or 5 billion can make a tremendous difference. So there are plenty of information in the European website. It's a reliable, of course, information. And uh, this regulation is important to remember. This is the 2019 slash uh, 1009 regulation will apply in a few days, in July, officially. So there was a little transition. Officially, it will apply. And um, so what is the aim of this regulation? Again, it opens a new market, single market for the fertilizing products. Uh, I purposely highlighted in yellow what I consider the most important keywords from each of these statements. It lays down common rules. It considers safety, quality, and labeling requirements for fertilizing products. So the consumer will know more accurately what this product is all about, which is very important, and introduces limits for toxic contaminants for the first time. So that's very significant. And it maintains optional harmonization because among the various uh, fertilizing companies in Europe, there should be set a new rules about a more harmonization. Um, so this regulation covers uh, the following important seven categories of these products. Namely, these are fertilizers which existed before. These fertilizers include the inorganic, organominerals, and organic. The rest of the list includes the new materials added, something like soil improvers, liming materials, growing inhibitors, plant biostimulants. And now, this plant biostimulants includes a, a, a subgroup of products like extracts, microorganisms. I underline the word microorganism because it's recently that we have, uh, we have understood the important role of microorganisms in plant nutrition. Not that we didn't know, simply we didn't pay attention. Now we have to, we are forced to rethink, and I underline the word rethink, about the approaches we are using to make sustainable agriculture. Why we are focusing so much on sustainable agriculture? What is the drive? It's not climate change only. Believe me, let me talk like a farmer. The farmer's income is increasing very slowly compared with the input increase. Particularly this year, it will be a farmer's nightmare. All the inputs, electricity, fuel, labor, uh, fertilizer cost, uh, pesticide cost, have increased at least 50%, up to 300%. Do you believe that the agricultural products, the farmer's pocket, will increase that much? No, not even 10%. So you can imagine what, pro what consequences the farmers. So what the farmer can do, he cannot influence the stock market of the fuel, not the stock market of the other inputs. The only thing a farmer can do is minimize the costs. So trying to find smart ways to do smart farming. I'm sorry to say that, but that's the reality. Uh, so this legislation does not apply to animal byproducts. Be careful. Uh, the amino acids, etc., they're using have to be of plant origin. And uh, it does not apply to plant protection products. Let me make a, 
parenthesis here. These products are not uh, agrochemicals, the biostimulants, so they're not classified as plant protection products, which require extensive research and registration. So they are free, they're open for organic agriculture, for, for integrated agriculture, and that's the only way to go to the um, uh, EU requirement to increase the organic agriculture by 2030 by 30%. That's the only way to go. However, and I'm saying that off the record, there are, these products have indirectly plant protection characteristics. Because if I apply, for example, a, no, a mineral, bentonite, zeolite, um, calcite, it's not going to kill the olive fly, it's going to deter it. It's not going to kill the wild boar, it's going to deter it, it's going to detract it. It's going to allow it to go away, to leave from my field, go anywhere else. So I can save my field. I don't know what's going to happen to the neighbor's field who has not sprayed these materials, but think about that. Um, I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, uh, so, uh, Aki, you have a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm, I'm concluding, Vageli. So that's why I said these are kind of reluctant. And uh, I will just skip this one. Um, again, this will be available for you. Well, I thank you for your attention. And I'm concluding, Vageli, in less than two minutes with some pictures that show uh, holistic. Uh, um, concept of what are biostimulants. So if I would like to summarize it, the main effect of biostimulants is, in my opinion, is to make the plants more vigorous to resist or tolerate abiotic stresses, which are main effects from climate change. It's drought, extreme heat, etc. So now we have some additional I would call them weapons or tools to fight the, uh, the problem of climate change. In this conference that we're working, they are proposing models and uh, things like that. But you know, I'm a practical person. Models are okay, but we need to find solution for tomorrow. The farmers need this for tomorrow, not for the next 10 years. So I appreciate your invitation, Pagelis, and I wish you good luck. And I congratulate you once again for this very not interesting, very practical uh, approaches. And uh, one more comment, since you are working with sulfur, sulfur needs to be further researched. It's a very unique uh, element. Sulfur, in my opinion, and I am a soil scientist, is equally important to nitrogen. How many people know that? How many people are approaching sulfur in that concept? So good luck. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Saki, Dr. Gertz, for the holistic approach you take in uh, such matters. Um, as a, a comment, um, biostimulants uh, reduce possible chemical deterioration of soil and is their use and innovation think hard. In any way, they can work. Thank you very much. And I okay. go to uh, Dr. Christos Vasilikiotis, Professor and Chair of Sustainable Agriculture Management at Perotis College for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Vangelis, and hello to everybody. Let me share my screen so I can start my presentation. So I hope you can all see my screen. Yeah, okay. yeah, go ahead. Okay, so. One second. So I'll give a very brief outline of my presentation. I'll cover very briefly the organic fertilizer. Uh, Sykes already mentioned a lot about the new regulation. I'll just point a couple important items. And what I want to concentrate is the role for soil organic matter 
in soil quality and plant health and production? And how can we use organic fertilizers as a tool to increase soil organic matter, while at the same time concentrating and putting a big emphasis on increasing soil microbial biomass and activity? These two are very closely tied together and I'll try to make that clear from my presentation. And I'm gonna conclude with some overall benefits of organic fertilizers. So the new EU regulations have two main categories for organic fertilizers. One is the organic fertilizers that rely primarily on organic carbon of solely biological origin. But the one we're talking about here is the organomineral fertilizers, which is the product that this project is gonna uh, trial. And it's a co-formulation of one or more inorganic fertilizers, in our case it would be sulfur, and one or more materials containing organic carbon and other nutrients of soil, solely biological origin. In this case, the uh, orange waste that can be converted. So some of the minimum nutrient content, if there's more than one nutrient, should be 2% nitrogen or 2% um, phosphate or 2% calcium. And the sum of those nutrients, according to the new regulations, should be at least 8% by mass. And finally, the organic carbon content should be at least 7.5%, but I think the one that we're discussing here is a lot higher than that. And of course, I'm not gonna get in details, but the new regulations also talk about uh, heavy metal and other pollutants that should be very minimal, and this is a list, you can look it up. And it's very important to have that in mind that we keep anything fertilizers to a very low amount of any toxic or heavy metals. Okay, so soil quality. Sykes talked about how we can use biostimulants to help crop and plant growth and increase plant health. And that's very important. And my main point here is that we need to also soil, look at soil. Soil is one of the most important aspects uh, the European Union is really recognizing that, and there's a new uh, set of funding coming up about the European uh, soil mission. So a lot of emphasis being put on soil. And that is very important because soil is what actually we can get a lot of the information for the plants. A lot of the biostimulants that we can add because they are lacking can actually be produced in the soil itself. So one of the main characteristics of a healthy and high quality soil is organic matter. And I'll come back to that. That actually is what helps a lot of the other parameters. For example, soil structure, infiltration rate, bulk density, keeping it low, ability to hold water, and having a high CUC. So what is organic matter? What's its role in soil quality? It has physical effects because it helps to form soil aggregates. And because of a uh, different carbohydrate glues that the microbes and other uh, <clears throat> components of the soil create, those soil ag aggregates become very stable. And by becoming stable, they resist uh, collapsing during rain or irrigation, and then they maintain very high water infiltration and also allow roots to penetrate. Additionally, they have a lot of nutritional and chemical effects. They increase cation exchange capacity uh, also the buffer soil pH, and the lower any aluminum toxicity. And finally, which is the most important part that I want to emphasize in this presentation, they stimulate root and crop growth through supporting diverse soil microbial communities. So how do we increase soil organic matter? There are two opposing processes. One is the addition of organic matter that can take place through roots, uh, surface residue that we have or other additions like manure or organic fertilizers we added. And of course, the exact opposite is the loss of organic matter through decomposition. Those factors are continuously at play and have to balance them so you can have continuous addition but also maintain uh, enough activity in the soil. So what determines the levels? Uh, it's climate, soil texture, landscape position, type of vegetation, and soil management. What we're going to concentrate today is talk about soil management with the addition of organic fertilizers that can actually help 
increase and maintain soil organic matter levels. Uh, there's a lot of studies. This is one study that looked at a survey of um, long-term experiments in Europe. And by looking at a whole range of um, metadata, the addition of organic matter into soil versus not organic matter addition, just using fertilizer, has a really very significant effect. As we can see in this uh, diagram, the pH doesn't change much uh, in most of the studies, but the aggregate stability, that means that soil aggregate, aggregates become much more stable, so the soil structure remains uh, much stronger and uh, increases. Soil organic matter is increasing. Earthworms also increase. Earthworms play a really big role in maintaining soil structure and also creating the soil uh, fertility. And also yields, the yields increase. By adding organic matter, we see a net increase of yields in a whole number of studies. Another really important uh, experiment, the one in Rothamsted, is more than 180 years. And what they're finding that continuous addition of uh, manure, as we can see here in, in the, the top line, has increasing organic matter in the soil. We see that if we stop adding manure, like the second line below it, then organic matter starts uh, getting lost because it's being used up by microbes through respiration. So continuous organic matter additions, in this case was uh, manure, but also organic fertilizers can keep increasing soil organic matter. So if you look at the soil, the main components of the soil is the living organic matter on top of it, the crops, the weeds, then those when they die or when they get harvested become the dead organic matter on the surface, which slowly becomes decomposed and that's the actively decomposing organic matter that's becoming part of the soil. And then slowly through, again, microbial transformations, that becomes uh, the humus, humic acids, folic acids, that is the more stable organic matter. So the factors, we're gonna talk some of those, that can influence the continuous creation of this humic matter is the CN ratio of the additions, carbon to nitrogen ratio, the temperature, the pH, moisture levels, microbial communities, nitrogen supplies, and aeration. So it's important to understand when we talk about organic matter, it's not just one type of organic matter. There are very different pools. There's the active organic matter. That's all the freshly decomposed materials. That cycles very fast. Bacteria decompose it, create their biomass. Some is lost as organic as a carbon dioxide and slowly keep cycling. That's really important pool because that keeps feeding the bacteria, maintains nutrient cycling, main, maintains rhizobium bacteria, mycorrhiza, all the microbial communities. And then slowly some of that becomes incorporated to more the particular organic matter, which is a little more stable. And eventually it becomes more stable humus. The humic acid, fulvic acids, long macromolecules, these are really stable, resist decomposition, and these are the ones that play dual role. One is maintaining a depository of nutrients, so any soil having 2% or more uh, organic matter, stable organic matter, will provide majority of fertility, so you need to reduce fertilizers, and for an organic um, vegetable production, if we go 5% or more, that you pretty much don't need a lot of fertilizers. There's plenty of fertility in the soil. But also the other thing, talking about climate change, as the other speakers mentioned too, organic matter is a way to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. So the more we build organic matter, we sequester uh, carbon, reduce CO2, and we have a positive reduction in the climate change. <clears throat> so building soil quality, Organic matter cycling, as I mentioned, based on microbial transformation is very important in carbon sequestration. Soil structure stability and water partitioning plays a big role. And microbial activity, that's really important. And we'll see how organic fertilizer can actually help with this. So microbial activity depends very heavily 
on different carbon food sources. So the organic fertilizer we use have to have a variety of carbon food sources in order to maintain a very diverse microbial community and support all nutrient cycling in the soil. And of course, we need bioavailable nitrogen and a diverse community of microbes. So by adding organic fertilizers, we help feed the microbes with the organic carbon sources. That leads to increased bacterial communities, both the structure, the functional groups, but also the activity, and then helps the nutrient cycling, nitrogen cycling, carbon cycling of the microbiome. It's very important to understand if having organic matter in the soil, in order for that organic matter to become nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium for the plants, microbes need to transform them. So organic matter needs continuous activity of microbial, uh, diverse microbial communities. And as I mentioned, the most influential factor for the quality and quantity of soil organic matter, the more stable one that we need, is the type of carbon input by the organic fertilizers. Now, one parameter we need to be, keep in mind when we add organic fertilizers is the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Very briefly, soil microorganisms need to have a CN ratio of 8 to 1, but in order to maintain their activity and grow, they need extra carbon for the metabolic needs. So soil organic matter in order to be produced by microbes, they need not only organic carbon and nitrogen for the biomass, but extra carbon. So for every eight parts for their body maintenance, they need another 16 parts of carbon per nitrogen in order for the metabolic energy. So ideally, a CN ratio of 24 to one is the one that provides a good balance of both energy and building blocks for microbes to continue building organic matter. The CN ratio of the soil is about 8 to 10 to 1. So any organic fertilizer that have a ratio of higher than 31, initially they will immobilize nitrogen. They will tie up nitrogen from the soil into the microbial activity. So the crop we plant, if we do it right away, will have actually a nitrogen deficiency. Anything 25 to 1 or less means there's the perfect balance and then less than 20 we have extra nitrogen to feed the crops. So it's important to keep that ratio in mind when we add soil uh, or, or organic fertilizers. Here's, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but that's the list of the different um, materials, organic materials. Manure has about 20 to one. Um, legume residues, we do cover crops, about 21 or 30 to one. And then corn stalks or wheat straw, it's pretty high, so 80 to one. So if you remember, when we incorporate wheat straw in the soil, we need to add some extra nitrogen because the CN ratio is very high in this case. <clears throat> now, the other thing, and Sakis mentioned that also, it's very important. One is carbon to nitrogen ratio. But additionally, soil microbes need phosphorus and sulfur at very fixed ratios in order to mineralize and build organic matter. So the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur stoichiometry is very critical to keep building organic matter. For every increase in carbon, we need to have additional nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur available in the crops. And I'm very glad to hear that this uh, organo, organic mineral fertilizer has additional of sulfur. That way we can keep that ratio at the required level. So in order to keep increasing organic matter, we have to keep adding organic amendments with carbon and other nutrients, or if our inorganic fertilizers have to add carbon source like crop residues. Now, here's a study done in Australia, and what they're doing, look, doing, looking at is the amount of nutrients required to build a ton of uh, carbon, organic carbon. So they're looking at that to say because we keep talking about increasing organic matter in the soil to build organic carbon, to sequester it, but that has a cost because you have to keep providing nutrients. So for every one ton of carbon we build in the soil, 
we need about 80 kilograms of nitrogen, 20 phosphorus, and 14 of sulfur. That's important to keep in mind that we keep to adding all the nutrients. Otherwise, we cannot build carbon. We cannot build organic matter in the soil. So another long-term study at Rothamsted. This is with wheat, and it's a very uh, important study to look at. And I don't know if I can have my pointer here to show. Okay, so if we look at the, the green line with um, the green <clears throat> triangles, that is um, the yield that they obtain by adding only farm yard manure, only manure. So from 1860s, adding manure, the yields kept increasing and increasing and got a lot higher than the yield with just fertilizer, which is the red squares underneath it. So that's important to understand that adding organic matter, increasing organic matter, and maintain at high levels, it's equivalent to fertilizer. So organic fertilizers can accomplish the same thing. Now, when they add organic matter plus extra nitrogen, then they can have an increase. And that's what we talked about. Nitrogen is also very important for building um, organic matter. So adding extra nitrogen in this case, they would have even higher. But if we compare just uh, manure, fertilized soil with regular fertilizer, you can see the difference. So we keep that in mind that organic fertilizers have the ability, provided they give the right carbon sources and balance of the other nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, and sulfur, they can maintain a very high fertility, this for wheat. Now what I want, the next one, sorry. What I also want to talk about is just adding fertilizer is not sufficient by itself. Crop rotation is very important, especially if we talk about organic farming. And here's a very interesting result they obtained in that same study, a Rotham step. We can see that the blue ones on the bottom is continuous wheat, not fertilized. The blue ones right below is continuous wheat with additional fertilizers. So you got quite good yields. And then if we look at the top ones with uh, the red and green, these are both uh, after first wheat in rotation. So they add another crop and then wheat following a different crop, not wheat following wheat. And you can see the huge increase in the yields. That's really important that crop rotation has actually multiple benefits and it can really benefit with the same type of fertility. This is the same type of either fertilizer or manure added than here and can have a huge increase. And why is that? Because when we rotate the different crops, add different types of carbon sources, and they promote a much more diverse microbial community in the soil. So we cannot just rely on one type of fertilizer and one type of crop continuously. We need to keep having this crop rotation and using a variety of fertilizers to maintain that um, variety of, and diversity of uh, microbial communities in the soil. So, to sum up, the benefits of organic fertilizers is increasing organic matter. We saw that they have a huge increase in yields just by adding organic matter, and they also help by sequestering carbon. They stimulate microbial activity, especially if you have a diverse source of different carbons. They're, of course, a nutrient source for, for plants. And the other thing that's very important is organic fertilizers have a very gradual release of nutrients. That ensures a season long supply. But at the same time, remember, when we add a certain number of units of nitrogen, they're not gonna all be available this, the first year. Usually with organic fertilizer, 30% becomes available in the, every year for about three, 30, three years. So it's a very gradual release, but as we're building organic matter in the soil, then that will be available and we can have extra fertility. And of course, organic fertilizers are less soluble. They're tied up in organic humic um, acids and fulvic acids. So there's minimum nutrient loss to the environment. So overall, we got building organic matter, storing fertility in the soil, sequestering carbon, and minimizing any losses and pollution to the environment. 
So thank for your attention and I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vasily Kiotis. Um, you said it all. And uh, I would um, say that um, no uh, organic matter, no production. All right? So it means that um, the organic matter connects uh, directly with um, the soil fertility because um, uh, the organic matter uh, as a as a uh, as a means let's say stimulates the underground world which are the microbes in our case so um um uh, having uh, finished with the presentations uh, i would like to uh, enter the discussion session of today's conference uh, those who have questions can address them directly to the um uh, to the speakers, and I look forward for a fruitful um, um, uh, discussion. So we take questions. We have a few minutes for it. I have a question, if I'm allowed. Um, that goes mostly to Sagis Gertzis, but also to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Vasilikotis, whether um, the biostimulants can collaborate with uh, processed byproducts in the soil uh, that are given as a fertilizer, and um, what uh, the impact can be of that collaboration, if there is any long term regarding uh, soil fertility? Well, can I start first, Vangelis? Yeah, go All right, the, the answer is absolutely yes. Okay. Nothing more. Don't want to elaborate more because bioprocessed, remember, organic products are very well fit and are part of the biostimulant company products. Yeah, I, to add to that, the only, only caveat is that we need to have a diverse of inputs. If we rely only on one type of fertilizer, that might have a very limited uh, range of uh, carbon sources. For example, some carbohydrates that are not um, covered the whole range of microbial uh, needs. So if we have a variety of uh, organic fertilizers that are by process, then I think we have, there's no problem. It can be actually really work together with biostimulants. And I want to add to that, actually, biostimulants are important because if we don't have already a very diverse soil, as like so one experiment at very poor soils, adding biostimulants have the, rate, the largest effect. That's because the soils lack these microbial communities. Now, if we build our soils slowly to the level that these communities are very active continuously and we keep feeding them with fertilizers, organic fertilizers, with crops, crop roots, and so on, then biostimulants are required less and less for the soil. It can be used on top of the plants, but not for the soil anymore. Yes, Christos, uh, Vangelis, sorry, let me add something. Um, it's a follow-up. Christos, remind me that I forget something important. Before we apply anything into the soil, we have to do something very simple that the farmers, unfortunately, are not doing. It costs 30 euros. It's a complete soil analysis. Now, my proposal many years now is that in addition to the soil analysis, tissue analysis is important, irrigation water analysis is important, not as much as the other two analyses. However, nowadays we have the technology, and as you know, technology's costs decrease by a time to do soil microbiology analysis. And I can give you a number. Uh, I got some soil samples yesterday, uh, the two days ago, from an olive uh, grove infested possibly with verticillium. So a complete soil biome analysis, complete to include every microorganism to the soil, costs currently less than 120 euros. Now, for a farmer, it sounds uh, pretty much. But if you consider how much and if it was available 20 years ago, first of all, it was not possible to make a complete 
Secondly, very specialized laboratories had those equipment and facilities, and it used to cost 10,000 euros. I mean, if you run a second conference next year, probably the numbers of this analysis will be lower. So let's remember that we have to do. Also, there are kits that we can analyze less expensive for particular soil microorganisms. So as Christos mentioned, if we, if we build a soil in two, three, four years, adding micronutrients, we don't need to continue that. So the efficiency is not going to be the same as in the first, in the building process, which may last three, four, five years, etc. Now, adding organic matter into the soil uh, will take more time. But the biostimulus, we don't need to do it. If we, you apply some microorganisms and they start uh, populating this environment, yeah, you need to be sort of careful. Okay, uh, thank you. Can, can, can the farmer, to continue on this, because <coughs> we have to conclude, uh, can the farmer uh, apply on his own or he needs some assistance? Or what else does he need in order to become... Uh, able to, to, to apply his own, you think? Everybody needs help, Vangelis. Uh, if you are sick, you need the help of a doctor. The farmer can do certain things, but not everything alone. This is the role of people like us. This is the role of programs, projects like this. The farmers need support. Fortunately, with the new EU legisla legislation, that with the... Uh, 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 agricultural consultants, which are going to be, the farmers will be subsidized to use assistance and help from agricultural components. And I'm pretty sure this uh, is already in application in Italy. The only country in Europe that has not yet applied that concept is Greece. We have the money from the European Union, they are standing somewhere, and we're not using it. So I'm pretty sure by the end of this year, next year, that will be effective. So the farmer will help, will, ha will have a help. He cannot do it by himself. Not neither by asking one salesperson, the usual person who are selling the farmers, the agrochemicals and the fertilizer. That needs a, a special, an expert, a little bit on that. So it's, it's a combination. Magdalene. If I'm allowed, if I'm allowed uh, to add a couple more items that the farmer needs in this case, uh, training for sure, in order to understand what he's doing and why he's doing it, and also investments. Otherwise, cannot uh, have an impact. Uh, this kind of methodology cannot have any impact, let's say, to the final production because a part of um, um, targeting to have. Uh, one quantity, I suppose he looks forward for the quality of its product of his product. So he needs those in combination, I believe. Angelique. Any more questions? Or Sorry, uh, yes, I want. Uh, I have uh, two comments. Uh, one about the biostimulants and one for organic matter, if I can. Of course. Well, regarding the biostimulant, I worked a lot on uh, humic acid uh, as a biostimulant on KD compost uh, and so on because I uh, worked with uh, Professor Piccolo, Professor Nardi, and we tried to um, test the biostimulants on soil. Of course, uh, the humic acid are really important substances that are naturally present in soil. But we use the, the, the humic acid because they contain also uh, in, in their molecules some uh, um, hormones also like uh, IHE and uh, acetic acid and uh, cytokinins and so on so stimulates the plant growth. The bias that uh, I worked also uh, with rhizobium that are considered also uh, stimulants for plant growth, in particular wine, saline soil, and so on. But I tried this, it is, it's important for plant growth, but they have a cost and are also per soil, I am a soil ecologist, so for soil ecosystem functioning, uh, functioning are reductive in respect to addition of organic matter that stimulates a lot 
of uh, microorganisms, of course, is uh, uh, less uh, quick the process than if the addition of a biostimulant. And this one, for me, in the, this is my opinion on biostimulant. The second uh, question is for the professor that speak, uh, spoke about the organic matter. And it's related to the addition of NP and phosphorus nitrogen to increase the organic uh, carbon in soil. Um, this sentence for me is uh, um, maybe for not for the people that don't, doesn't work in this field uh, may, may induce in mistake because uh, this does not means that if I add uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, or sulfur, I increase the amount of organic carbon. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur um, are useful to uh, potentially uh, um, induce carbon stock in soil because I help to or the formation of humic substances uh, to stimulate a part of a microorganism to increase the carbon stock in soils. But if I have a nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, I, I can't uh, produce carbon in soil. It's all, uh, only to uh, precise this, uh, this sentence. Oh, let me, yeah. No, I did not mean that by adding those, you can increase carbon. I'm saying, if you're adding carbon and you want to make more organic matter, you need, in addition to carbon additions, you need the other, the other four. Otherwise, okay. if, if those are not available, you cannot build organic matter. That was my yeah. point. It was not adding those to increase carbon, but if you're adding carbon, those should be also present. Otherwise, if you have deficiency in phosphorus or sulfur or nitrogen, then you're going to be limited and you won't be able to build enough carbon or organic matter in the soil. That was what I was trying to say. So, if yes. you understood. Okay, thank you. Uh, if, if I can add something on that, the micronutrients play a significant role in the total biomass produced. Now, we have to remember that most of us, when we think about plants, think about the above ground part. The root system is very important, and that root system will become organic matter. And there is a ratio, a relationship between the root system, the mass of the root system, and the mass of the above ground. So okay. the more above ground mass, the more root system. The more root system, the more organic matter. This is what Christos uh, is meant by NPK and S. Thank you. And Magellan, add one more thing about testing, because I think that's very important. Like you mentioned, soil testing is important. And looking at the microbiome also is very important, but I'm concerned that if you just look at molecularly to identify all types of microbes, you don't really get information about the activity of those. And I think that needs to be coupled with actual biochemical assays where you check with different carbon sources which bacteria or microbes or fungi are actually actively available in the soil. And I think there's a whole set now about 10 different um, essays have been developed that actually looked at soil quality to identify those microbial, um, the diversity of the microbes and see if they're improving. It doesn't tell you if it's good or not, but if you're improving your soil. So it's in, I think important to have also those biochemical assays as a tool. And Christos, by the way, uh, want to mention your, um, your particular studies with the soil respiration, which can be easily measured. Now we have the facilities. Soil respiration is directly related with the amount of microorganisms, the amount, we don't know which one. So soil respiration is a strong indication about the microbial activity, and that can be easily measured nowadays. Students of nowadays can do many more things that we used to do 40 years and 50 years ago. Simply, they don't have the common sense that we used to have 40 years ago. Any more questions? Well, I need to run to the other conference. Okay, I, I so have I, another I, one because uh, I've been stimulated yeah. by the discussion we have. Vangeli, I will, I will and give I'm an agronomist, so I have to go. 
I and will I, give I, you by your stimulants. And I, and I work in, in extension. So uh, are there any particular microbes, kind of species or something that we are targeting? Um, and those are connected to the X cultivation or it's all the same, let's say. Is there any way to, to suggest something to this or to, to, to focus on something? To say, for example, that uh, those uh, biostimulants are good for this species of uh, microbes that can assist the X cultivation, cucumber cultivation for it or something like that. You have to, to, to do a little reverse engineering here, Vangelis. Yeah. Remember, you have a soil analysis and you see that you have a lot of phosphorus in the soil, but then you make a leaf analysis and you don't see much phosphorus on the leaves. That is the case when you need to introduce mycorrhiza microorganisms. Okay. Mycorrhiza is good for that. Uh, uh, rhizobium bacteria, you cannot grow soybean without rhizobia. So, so they are selective, selective in their action. So th there is some kind of a system where yes. you can uh, rely upon. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. <laughs> Any more remarks? Going once. Let me ask a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask the question to the, the company making the, um, the orange um, fertilizer. What's the energy input to make that? Is it high? Is it, is it uh, because we need to consider the carbon footprint. Is there a high energy cost in creating that uh, orange uh, powder? Yes, I can, uh, I can answer. And uh, of course, we consider that, that uh, in our energy balance uh, and uh, what we are uh, implementing uh, right now is uh, practically on top of the plant. Uh, we are uh, setting up photovoltaic panels. And because we are in Sicily and the sun is strong as much as Greece, practically speaking, 80%, 80% of all the energy required for producing the 20,000 tons that I said before that you can produce over three ships. So 80% of the energy will be provided by the solar panels. So, of course, it's not uh, net zero because uh, it's still, uh, we, need, uh, we need to plug into the grid. Nevertheless, uh, we, can, uh, we can balance uh, the uh, need for energy, which is, uh, mostly used in liquefying the sulfur because we get solid sulfur and we need to turn it into liquid in order to mix everything okay so we are uh, we are working on these photovoltaic uh, plants on top on top uh, the building yes thank you I take, uh, Mr. Mr. Vergos, I take also the opportunity, just a moment, to remind that this is just the opening conference, and we will have other two conferences, one on the way, on the progress, and a final one. So we will bring all the results from the field test, and we will move on and we will compare the real tests from the field that we are implementing in Italy and Greece to all the, the uh, things that we said also today and uh, with the preliminary tests that we also introduced today by the uh, Professor Muscolo. Okay, so we will do that. Okay. We, we hope next year to, to be able to have the first results coming out that uh, where we can um, uh, discuss in a different way, let's say, what the benefits are. Yes. Uh, 
Okay. Are there any more remarks, questions, any observation regarding this uh, conference? Vangelis? Yes, I'm sir. I have a sample of this material produced in Greece. As soon as uh, uh, Mr. Schialetti sends us the stuff, because we don't have it yet. Okay, but it will come. We it can work come. that out. After all, you're part of the project here, so don't worry about it. Yes. Well, I, I yes. want to make some side, some side pot experiments. I'm working a lot in, not only in soils, but I'm, I'm working a lot in hydroponic. So you have to remember that plants don't grow only in soils. The trend, yes, yes. The trend is to grow them in, in soilless agriculture. So I will be very glad if you are interested to make some special substrates for hydroponic, including inorganic materials like perlite. We're using perlite a lot mixed with this one. We have already done it with some other uh, biosolids. So I'll be we, very glad. We, to we have it in our program, in our schedule. Don't worry about Great. it. Okay. So let's all have a nice weekend. <laughs> you okay. too. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Uh, if nothing else, let me close uh, today's session, if you all agree, uh, by saying that uh, focusing on plants growth microenvironment colloquium for quantity and quality primary production. Um, uh, I, I thought our speakers today covered with success uh, scientific related subjects with clarity and practical significance of what the project potentially represents in the field of contemporary production optimization. As a final comment in closing today's conference, I would say that the efficient management of industrial bioproducts and wastes for the production of media to be used in plant and animal, of course, nutrition. Uh, for fertilizers are nutrition for us, for the plant. Uh, it hits the button of cyclical economy that is priority one indicator of sustainable development. In a, in a significant vehicle against environmental and or natural resource uh, distortion. In terms of uh, sustainability, others could well be carbon and water footprints you already entered this field during the presentations. They all contribute to gradual velocity mitigation of climate change. Nevertheless, we currently live uh, through an ascending food security crisis, which according to Professor Nelson of the University of Illinois at Urbana, will undoubtedly uh, turn to be nutrient security crisis in the near future. To that said, our organization should continue research in all production areas of biotic and abiotic effects resource management, raw material processing, and to parameters of social impact. Well, with this, thank you all very much for your contribution in today's conference, and look forward to projects implementation, Mr. Schialetti. And all, of course, wish you to have here on campus sometime in the near future. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.